welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to talk about Wi-Fi. Specifically, I'm going to explain the main Wi-Fi standards and generations. So, let's go and get started. In 1971, the first wireless data network, AlohaNet, was turned on at the University of Hawaii. In 1987, NCR demonstrated the first commercial wireless networking technology called WaveLAN, and along with others saw the benefit of establishing a standard. To this end, they approached the 802 Landman Standards Committee of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers, or IEEE. In turn, this formed a working group named IEEE 80211 to develop wireless networking standards. And so, this is where the 80211 we see in Wi-Fi specifications comes from. In 1997, the first 80211 standard, simply called 80211, was released. This allowed wireless data transfers at up to 2 megabits a second and was not widely adopted. However, in 1999, two updates, known as 80211B and 80211A, were released. Like 80211, 80211B operates in the 2.4 GHz frequency band and increased maximum data transmission speed to 11 megabits per second. Meanwhile, 80211A operates at 5 GHz and offers speeds of up to 54 megabits a second. However, as 80211A was more costly to implement, it was 80211B that proved more popular in the consumer market. Also in 1999, the Wireless Ethernet Compatibility Alliance, or WECA, was formed. A year later, 80211 technology was given the name Wi-Fi, with WECA subsequently renamed as the Wi-Fi Alliance. This has a great website at wifi.org although a form needs to be completed to access the most useful information. As always in computing, standards continued to advance, and in 2003, 80211G was introduced. Like 80211B, this operates in the 2.4 GHz frequency band, but delivers a theoretical maximum speed of 54 megabits a second, just like 80211A. Five years later, in 2008, 80211N was launched. This is a dual band technology operating at both 2.4 and 5 gigahertz and increased the maximum theoretical data rate to 600 megabits a second. 2013 then saw the release of 80211AC which operates in the 5 gigahertz band and delivers a theoretical maximum speed of 6933 megabits a second. In 2016, the Wi-Fi Alliance then amended 80211AC to a second version known as 80211AC Wave 2, although the maximum theoretical data rate remained the same. Before we continue, it's important to note what the data transfer speed so far noted actually mean. The figures I've cited are the theoretical maximum data transfer speeds for each standard. But these speeds will never be enjoyed by a user for three reasons. Firstly, the figures so far cited are the maximum physical layer speed, or phi rate, which is the maximum speed at which bits of data can be transmitted by physical hardware. However, hardware utilisation is never totally efficient so the real-world data rate, or throughput, has to be lower. So, let's add in some typical throughput figures, which are here based on a Cisco white paper that calculates them based on a 70% efficiency in most cases. If this is hard to get your head around, imagine a train transporting carriages full of data. In this analogy, the phi rate reflects the speed of the train, the rate at which carriages can travel down the track but throughput indicates how much data is actually transported, and this will depend on things like how full the carriages may be. Secondly, whilst all Wi-Fi standards have a maximum supported phi rate, 
Actual hardware does not have to achieve this to be certified for a particular Wi-Fi standard. Rather, the Wi-Fi Alliance sets a minimum that devices must adhere to, but it's up to manufacturers to decide on their individual hardware capabilities. So, for example, whilst all 802.11ac access points operate at the 80 MHz bandwidth, some also function at 160 MHz, which can double data transmission speeds. To illustrate the point, here's some more data from Cisco indicating how the fire rate and delivered throughput varies for some typical 802.11ac access points. As we can see, the difference between high-end and low-end products is very significant. A key takeaway is therefore that not all devices with the same Wi-Fi specification will operate at the same speeds. And so, here's a revised table indicating the range of maximum fi rates for the first five Wi-Fi standards. And whilst this is a contradiction in terms, it's also how maximum fi rates are commonly expressed. Also, please note that there are a great many contradictory figures out on the internet, and that here I've relied on information from Intel and Cisco. Finally, we need to be aware that real-world Wi-Fi performance depends on a whole range of factors. These include signal strength, which reduces the further you are from an access point, how many people are sharing an access point's bandwidth at the same time, and how many nearby wireless networks are competing to transmit data on the same radio frequencies. If you want to know the speed of the connection you are actually achieving, in Windows, click on the Wi-Fi icon on the taskbar. Next, click on Properties for the Wi-Fi network you are connected to, and scroll down. So here, for example, my laptop has an 802.11ac connection that's receiving and transmitting data at 866 megabits a second. In Wi-Fi's first 14 years, five standards were released and things started to get a little complicated. In 2018, the Wi-Fi Alliance therefore introduced a new marketing program called Generational Wi-Fi. This sought to assign a consumer-friendly naming convention to Wi-Fi generations, so providing manufacturers, operators and end-users with an easy-to-understand description for both the Wi-Fi technology contained in a device and the connection that device makes with a Wi-Fi network. Generational Wi-Fi names do not replace previous Wi-Fi standards, although their use is strongly encouraged. To this end, in 2019, 802.11ax was released, but is widely known as Wi-Fi 6. In turn, 802.11ac was retrospectively given the label Wi-Fi 5, and 802.11n found itself known as Wi-Fi 4. The Wi-Fi Alliance also created symbols for these Wi-Fi generations, which we can see on its website here. It should also be noted that whilst Wi-Fi standards before 802.11n were not honoured with a name, they are sometimes unofficially referred to as Wi-Fi 3, 2 and 1. When it comes to backwards compatibility, it's important to note that a Wi-Fi generation indicates the most advanced technology a device supports. So, for example, most Wi-Fi 6 devices will support all previous standards. This means that when two devices of two different generations wish to communicate, they can do so at the highest speed that both devices support. Talking of speed, Wi-Fi 6 is a dual-band 2.4 and 5 GHz technology that delivers a fi rate of up to 9608 megabits per second. In 2020, Wi-Fi 6e was also announced, still under the 802.11ax standard, but adding support for a new 6 GHz frequency band. In 2024, it's also expected that Wi-Fi 7, or 802.11be, will arrive, and that this will deliver a fire rate of 46,120 megabits a second. In addition to the main 802.11 connection standards and their associated generations, there are some other key Wi-Fi standards it's worth being aware of. 
For a start, we have security protocols, the first of which was introduced in 1997 and called Wireless Equivalent Privacy, or WEP. However, in 2003, this was replaced by the much improved Wi-Fi Protected Access Protocol, or WPA. A year later, an even more secure version called WPA2 was introduced, and still today is a standard method to protect a Wi-Fi connection. For example, if we look back to my laptop's connection properties, we can see that WPA2 is being used. However, Wi-Fi 6 introduced WPA3, which offers stronger encryption and makes passwords harder to hack. So, Wi-Fi will become more secure as more access points and user devices use Wi-Fi 6. Another common Wi-Fi standard is Miracast. This allows video content to be transmitted over Wi-Fi, so facilitating a wireless connection to a TV or monitor. This can even occur when no Wi-Fi network is available, as Miracast can make use of another Wi-Fi technology called Wi-Fi Direct. As the name implies, Wi-Fi Direct allows two devices to share a direct wireless connection with no access point involved. Such one-to-one -one connections can be useful to connect cameras and other peripherals, or to share data between two computers in any location. Finally, it's worth noting the existence of Wi-Fi Easy Mesh. This is a standard for Wi-Fi networks that utilise multiple access points, so can be very useful in homes or other locations where a single access point cannot provide enough coverage. Today, it's hard to think back to a time when all online devices had to be attached to a network using either a cable or a cellular phone connection. Without doubt, over the past couple of decades, Wi-Fi has helped to transform personal computing into interpersonal computing. And I hope that in that context, you found this video on Wi-Fi standards to be useful. But now, that's it for another video. If you've enjoyed what you've seen here, please press that like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And I hope to talk to you again very soon.